Good evening, welcome to this new public dialogue promoted by the Fondazione per l'Innovazione Urbana. Uh, tonight it is a great pleasure for us to have with us uh, Milo Rao, who is considered one of the most innovative uh, the other director uh, of our times, who has given a, a new impulse to uh, political theater and art uh, activism, founder of the International Institute of Political Murder Company and currently uh, artistic director of the NT Ghent, State Theater in the city of Ghent. Good evening, Milo, and thanks for accepting our invitation. Yeah, hi, thanks for having me. And let me introduce also Chiara Faini. Uh, she is uh, the coordinator of cultural activities of the Fondazione per l'Innovazione Urbana, and she will uh, uh, dialogue together with me with you on, uh, in the first half of our uh, conversation. As usual, in the second uh, part of our conversation, there will be the possibility for those who are watching us live on our Facebook page to. Uh, you the questions using the uh, uh, comments space in our uh, Facebook uh, page. Um, so I would start our conversation, Milo, uh, with uh, a recent interview that you gave uh, to the Italian newspaper uh, Repubblica. Um, in, uh, in, at some point in the interview, you affirmed that tragedy seems to be uh, the, the the best image understanding the, the current situation produced by the pandemic and I was also and I also read that just before the lockdown you were in uh, in Brazil working with the Semterra movement for a new Antigone production so I would like to start our conversation with one dimension of classical tragedy that seems to me to be um, largely neglected in uh, the, in the current public discourse on the pandemic, which is death. Uh, in particular, since the very first day of the lockdown, there have been mm, the, con the com conversation, public discourse has been mainly concentrated in discussing uh, the economic impact of the pandemic, uh, the risk for individual liberty and social controls, which are all, of course, extremely important. Uh, questions, whereas death seems to be some way reduced just to data and uh, statistics. In, in most cases, it seems as if we neglected that behind uh, these data and figures, there were lives, uh, affections, suffering of several people that not even had the opportunity, the chance to stay close to their dear, or to recall Antigone, actually to participate to funeral ceremonies. So. What I would like to ask you if you can expand more on the tragedy of the pandemic and how theater can intervene on it, especially because in the, that same interview, you were saying that contemporary theater seems to be unable to reinvent, reimagine tragedy, and that's the reason why we continue to reproduce the old classics. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting to talk or to start the discussion with the question of death, because as you as you mentioned, I was just uh, before the lockdown, I was in, in Brazil or during the lockdown in Europe. I was uh, in, in the north of Brazil, in Amazonia, while I was hearing that uh, the confinement started, my theater closed, everything. And it seemed quite, uh, quite abstract to me. And then it happened also in Brazil and now Manaus. So the, the capital of the Amazon is, is one of the, the capitals of Corona worldwide. You know, it's a kind of a Amazonian New York, you could say. Uh, but with much less health care. And in the center of Antigone, the play we played, and it's now that I, I understand this, is the dead body of somebody. And the solution, and it's a quite interesting solution of Creon, so let's say the incorporation of the rationality of modern state is to deny it. When he says to Antigone, he says, okay, he's dead, but let's do as if he wouldn't be dead, let's start anew. Let's not come back on this. He, he, he somehow denies it and she says, but he's lying there and the dogs are eating it and you can't deny it. So she searches for a ritual and he just wants to deny it. He wants to find a kind of a, a solution. And I think there we have, of course, the conflict of, uh, or perhaps even the, 
um, yeah, the conflict of a modern society that denies death and the ritual society, the traditional society that tries to include death, the gods, the past, the present, the future, everything in a kind of a more secular understanding of, of, of what is happening here. So in another understanding of time. And uh, it was just today when I was reading uh, some texts of uh, Donna Haraway, so a philosopher I like a lot, and she was saying the problem of today is that we, we, we forgot mourning. We lost so many species, for example, and we can't bring them back. So first of all, we should understand what we lost before we can start to kind of fix it. And what happened when Corona was happening is that people was kind of the reaction of our states was very rational when we were happy and quite irrational when we were unhappy but all in the logic of let's somehow fix it and not understanding that the problem that is now shown to us is a problem that we can't fix. It's a problem that is in the core of our system, of our destructive capitalist system, and we can't just fix it. And there we have the difference, I was talking in Republica, in between bourgeois drama, where you just can't fix it. If you have problem in your, I don't know, your relationship, you talk. And in the end, you will find a solution. So everything will be fixed. Even it's interesting that Freud puts the Oedipal thing in the middle of a talking <laughs> cure, as if you could fix that you killed your father and you fucked your mother, but you can't. Because there is a crime, there is a perversity in the middle of the whole functioning of what we call civilization. And I think that's this moment when the doors of hell somehow open for a moment and we see what is really happening, how this global system is functioning, how, uh, for example, very interesting, normally in 500 years ago, uh, the last time that the civilization was taken by a disease, a virus like, like Corona was 500 years ago when Europe was colonizing uh, America. Now it came from China to Europe. That's a, for me a kind of a little ironic uh, metaphor in it. But what we see is the whole functioning of how it is and understanding that we can't come back, we can't fix it. We can't come back to what we did before. We can do it, eh? but then it will happen again in one year or in five years or in 10 years and in 30 years it's, it's over. So how can we understand that we are not in a dramatic but in a, in a tragic situation? I think this is the first step we have to do as a, um, as a, as a civilization to understand the moment we are in. Okay. Thank you, Milo. Uh, I, I want to continue and expand on something that you have just uh, uh, said. It seems to me that the pandemic has made evident once again what all critical analysts uh, already know, so that there is a structural contradiction between life and profit-oriented social reproduction. There is some kind of an aporia which is embedded in the, the very logic of uh, uh, capitalism. I recently read an, in, uh, a, a, an interview of a Swiss tycoon, uh, Sami Saviris, who has criticized the Swiss government for the containment uh, measures and the lockdown because, according to him, it has provoked a loss of billions in the national economy uh, just to uh, impede uh, couple of hundred uh, of more death in uh, in the country uh, and this seems we to me quite evident of this structural contradiction and so while i was reading uh, this interview i was thinking to another of your recent projects the the novel vangelo production in uh, in matera uh, with migrant workers and refugees uh, which are uh, of course among the most exposed Okay, to the negative effect of the, uh, the emergency. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking to what William Du Bois was saying uh, in The Souls of the Black Folk, we could say that some way the migrant conditions is what could make possible kind of a second sight on contemporary capitalism and its uh, controversies. So actually what I would like to ask you is if... Uh, so if migrations, how migrations and the migrant condition can help political and activist theater as yours in the, criti in the critique of 
the contemporary society in the time of the pandemic? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, first of all, I would say that uh, for me, the, the role of theatre is to overcome the critique. Because I think the, 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 the time of critical art is somehow, is somehow over. Because in all possible ways, we deconstructed the system we are living in. I think now everybody really knows and learns it even in school. I learned in school that capitalism is bad while being prepared to a capitalist society. So I think we learned really to be completely schizophrenic, the whole society. We know that everything will collapse, but at the same time, we try to come back as fast we can to this perversity, to this doom's machine that actually is this civilization. Uh, even, I mean, by implementing a term like Anthropocene, which is called our time, is very strange, as if Anthropos or the human could only act in that way. But it's not a human problem, it's a systematic problem. So we should call it capital or C, you know, I don't know how, but of course not Anthropocene. You, wanna, you understand what I mean? And I think there is really, and there is really a way uh, in theater, and that's, I think for me, the very beautiful uh, functioning of it, perhaps be, because it's not so, sometimes it's not so expensive, or you can produce fast, but that it's always very direct what you are doing. If you're going to South Italy and you say, let's do a Vangelo, okay, it's a film, it's a theater play, uh, together with, with migrants, then you have to work with them, then you see under which conditions they live, then you search together ways of getting out of these conditions. You have to legalize the people you work with, then you find out the ways how to legalize. So how is a working contract working, etc., etc. So you kind of find out how simple you can convert uh, exploitation by solidarity, how simple it is. For example, the Italian state should just say it's illegal that anybody is not regularized in, in Italy. It's against the constitution. Let's change it. Let's change it. Every enterprise that works with people that is not regularized, it's illegal. And then we check it out and we, we, we see how it can come. That's why we, from the Gospel of Matthew, we took this uh, quote from Jesus or whoever said it, uh, I didn't come to abolish the law, I, did to full, I came to fulfill it. Because the laws are there, the possibilities are there, we are living in a democracy. And I think this is the beautiful thing of theater, that you can create a space, a project, where, let's say, in the relations of the people doing a project together, doing a film or whatever, uh, you can kind of develop under the alibi of doing a Jesus film or doing Antigone or doing, I don't know, whatever sounds fine and gives, brings you some money to produce it, produce a kind of a, a alternative social machine of how it could work too. And that's why I'm now we are kind of uh, finishing the, the, the editing of the, of the Jesus film, of the Novo Vangelo. And uh, it's crazy how... The political campaign we did for housing and for papers, for documents, uh, the pictures out of the of the kind of this this Pasolini reenactment, and uh, how all really comes together, how all this makes sense, you know. So you also find out by theater that the social sphere, the cultural sphere, the economic sphere, the utopic and the realistic sphere, they are only in our brains. Uh, disconnected, but actually they are completely connected. And how you could bring these disconnected systems together again to, 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 to create another space of, uh, of gathering, actually. Okay, thank you. Hi, Milo. Hi. Uh, <laughs> thank you for joining us. Joining us. Uh, my first question is uh, when you took over the antique and theater you set out you published a 10 rules manifesto and uh, all the productions should follow uh, the rules of the manifesto so according to the very first uh, rule you claim a specific role for art and theater you say that they should not just portray the world but they should deal with the real issues, the big issues of our time, and contribute to change, to shape uh, the world we live in. So given uh, the, current, the current circumstances, do you think uh, this rule still applies? And what kind of performance, what kind of theater, what kind of art 
uh, do you think about when you think about changing the world right now? I'm talking about uh, art in general, and of course, we are very curious to hear about also how you think you can contribute with your performances and with your with your theater, actually. When we when we uh, start to talk about possible explicit rules, how to make uh, theater today, how to open the institution to a more democratic, more um, global way of, of creating, for example, not making the Czech of uh, Shakespeare karaoke, but create new plays with new voices, new ways of working, including the public, including even from the beginning on the critique, having scandals and everything. So. And having also a theater that is less heavy, that we can like transport somewhere with some sustainability, not produce big, huge plays and then only show it five times. No, to really like trying to develop even in the during the shows that play. Um, we were doing it like two, three years before the so-called the Corona crisis. So we did it just to say what explicitly we have to apply that what we are talking about such a long time, I think for since two generations, people is talking about bringing this kind of theater to the center of the system. So the city theaters, the national theaters, what do we have to apply? So it's kind of the dogma rules like from Lars von Trier that is a, if you want to break the system, you have to be very explicit because we can talk forever, but we need dogmatic rules to say, and then we follow it or we try to follow it. Sometimes it makes, of course, no sense. I think there is no play except one I did as a, as a kind of an example. There's not one play we produce that is following the rules, but uh, everybody tries as much he can. And now what we see uh, when we are uh, like uh, thinking about next season, starting to, to make the plans, etc that we can adapt many of these rules uh, to next season. For example, that we don't have heavy sets, that we have an international way of, uh, of producing, that we had, I mean, even before we started to produce the way we have to produce now through Zoom, of course we used that. Uh, for example, Orestes in Mosul, we went to Mosul for some days, for some weeks, twice, but most of it we were talking through Zoom. We were rehearsing with these people through Zoom because it was impossible to do it in another way uh, around. And I think this is this is um, this is really important to go on on that way of democratizing the system, not asking how can we do the Shakespeare next season as a monologue or as a, I don't know connected by Zoom, etc. What kind of play can we do that depicts the tragedy of our time? What voices do we have to listen to? Where can we, for example, uh, find an answer to how should we live, you know? Mm -hmm. So now I, I, I see that a lot of people is kind of, how can we, for example, in a pre-globalized way, how can we have an economy that is more local? And so they go for a search and they search here and there, perhaps in other cultures, perhaps in the past, perhaps in a utopic future, etc. And to open the system of theater that they become uh, how to say like like ateliers, like like universities, like like workshops to do so. That you do projects to have kind of findings in the end. That you have answers. That you have a space to find this out. And we are working on a lot of as and again, for example, on a lot of different new lines. Something that we call the mobile academy. So really going in the city, going outside the theater, what we did anyway, but now we can go, with, uh, we can do it systematically. Or for example, we, we uh, in one, I think the third or the fourth rule of the Gantt Manifesto, it is forbidden to have heavy sets. Yeah. And now we are very happy to have, uh, to have sets that are not existing. Or for example, uh, the New York Times was asking me last uh, week, what are you doing uh, now? What? play will you do? Uh, how will you react on this? And I said, yeah, I have many plays where the people, for example, one play is called Family, and the cast is a family. So I just had a call before with them and they are rehearsing at home. So they are doing a new Corona version of the play at home because they are anyway together, you know? And if you adapt real, let's say, social context to the stage, what we, what we started to do some years ago, then of course you can smoothly react on it. And I think the last thing is that somebody wouldn't, I wouldn't, if, if I would just be kind of 
professionally an art maker and my boss would call me and say okay today tomorrow at 10 you come and we do the shakespeare 20 people together i would say but fuck you i will not i will not take this risk mm -hmm. you know and the others shouldn't take this risk mm -hmm. but when you really know what you do you want to do it you take care of the other anyway so it's a completely other context of uh, of working i think this is and the last thing for me what was always very important if actors can't act then they are dramaturgs, they are intellectuals, they can write, you know? We always said, okay, you are an actor, we don't need an actor in the play, so you can be, I don't know, a press officer, or you can, you can do whatever you also like to do. So we had in Antigent a lot of shifts all the time of kind of diversification of what we need at that moment, because everybody has a lot of, 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 of I don't want to call it talents, just practical knowledge. And uh, if we need other practical knowledge, we use this practical knowledge, you know, and not the other one that we can't use in this time. So I think it's a quite, a quite normal, organic way to, to respond on, on a crisis like this. And again, I think theater can hear as being a, an institution that is made out of humans, more or less. Of course, we have this architecture of the 19th century, and this is a bit problematic because you need 600 people to have a break even, and that eco economically it pays out. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of, but this is the only real problem we have at the moment. It's an economical problem, of, or even an architectural problem, I would say. Um, and there you can find, I mean, if you think one afternoon, you can find five different solutions. So it's really not. I, I I don't see it as a really problematic situation. I have to be I have to be honest. From the beginning on, um, I only saw it as a as a as a yeah. It's it's a it's a it's a hard time. Sorry, I'm always like in the, the street. People is walking. Uh, here are two <laughs> two windows, and I'm always seeing people. And I have a huge rose in front of my house. And always people is stopping to because everything is opening, all the flowers. So. Uh, and people is stopping, and sometimes they try to take some flowers, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, but that makes me a bit, uh, a bit nervous sometimes. Um, yeah, voila, so yeah. Okay, but thanks. Actually, you answered also my next ex next question, but also that links to something else I would like to talk um, to you about. Uh, in Italy, I, I, I'm not sure it's the same, for instance, in Belgium or in Germany, but in Italy, the most likely scenario right now is a slow reopening of everything. And the very last thing that is going to reopen are uh, performance venues, such as theater, music venues, and so on and so forth. And so you kind of answered already to part of this question, but I, I would like to um, to know your opinion about how do you think this will impact our society from many point of views. I'm talking about art workers, that, because in Italy we are talking about stopping everything until January next year. And actually the arts, the cultural sector was the very first one to stop uh, already in February. So it's going to be a likely 10 months lockdown uh, for uh, performance uh, venues. So what do you think are likely to be uh, the impacts of this lockdown on, for instance, art workers? And also, and this you answered already a little bit, what kind of productions will survive uh, more likely uh, for economic issues or for technical issues, for instance, but also what do you think is if there is a risk for our society to just shut up uh, a big part of the cultural voice for 10 months? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's crazy. It's completely crazy. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's of course crazy that music, theater, uh, all these people that, uh, all these art forms that are working by bringing a lot of people in a, in, a, in a small time together in one space, like the art of gathering people is touched the most. Mm -hmm. So let's say the most, the oldest, the most political, because gathering is kind of, I mean, in the, in the very first sense of the word, is 
political. So it's it's kind of creating a public that is co-present in the same moment, in the same space of time. It's, of course, the most needed in this time, in my opinion. And on the other t- uh, on the other hand, it's the most the most difficult when you have a, a virus like uh, Corona that is anti theatrical because you can do beautiful films now, you can stream films, you can watch the whole Netflix. I think a lot of people that never read now like read two books a week. So you have on the one hand uh, a kind of culture flourishing. For example, I'm since a long time I'm writing again. I was just like writing every morning what I have to stage in the afternoon. But I was never writing uh, or giving interviews or now talking, just taking an hour and to talk to somebody I didn't know before. I wouldn't have done this like some weeks ago because we were rehearsing in the evening. So it's kind of, it gives other space. And I think first thing we should do, we should explore these other spaces, of course. On the other hand, I have to, I have to confess that the most touched form of theater is the theater I hate anyway. So with the big stage and the big public and the big, you know, and the big ensemble and this whole, I mean, we have to be honest that uh, the problem again is the combination of an art form. So the European canon with all these people on stage, plus the architecture of Europe of the 19th century and Corona is against this. Corona is completely against this. And this is, as I said, on the one hand, a chance, uh, uh, because a lot of, let's say, avant-garde theater, uh, you can just stage it. You can stage uh, many of Rimini protocol plays. You can stage, you know, where you have just like four people, five people going in a room, watching a play, etc. Uh, I don't want to be uh, here satirical or cynical about it. I know the situation and my, my uh, production company, I have also a, a company, a theater company besides the, the Entegent, which has no subsidies at all. And if we can't play for one, two months more, it's, it's, uh, it's over. I mean, then it's, 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 it's done. And we are, we are searching plan B, plan C, plan D. How can we survive? What can we do? Okay, we make a movie version, we make this, we make that, we make this. But we start thinking. And before we were just like kind of, oh, I don't know, we are going to this city, then we go to that city, then we go to that city, we play here, there, here, there, here, there, we are touring like crazy. Uh, in the meanwhile, I was filling the big rooms in, in the end again to make, uh, to make Lamb Gods or Shakespeare or whatever. I mean, I didn't do it, but you know what I, what I, what I want to say. So there were these two systems I was in and both systems are fucked now. So it's, it's the situation I see. And now I see how the one system can learn from the other and how together we can create forms. I mean, of course, there's the digital forms, that's for sure. Then there, there are the monologues. Then there are the people working somewhere else. Then there are the amogatistic forms. Then there is really like to do movie or to write or to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there are ways. But on the other hand, of course, we should continue to search forms. And the last thing... But this is very structural and very, very banal. Uh, if we disconnect income or let's say payment of work and work, if we finally disconnect it, so the basic uh, general basic income, if we have this, we can stop with all these discussions. Because then the artists just continue in other spaces. And if the big spaces where they can do a lot of money are reopened, they do it. Or perhaps they don't want to do it because they have the basic income, you know? And I think especially if we connect um, creative work to an income, if we don't disconnect this, we will have the same problem in every crisis again. And now we have just, Corona is kind of hardcore neoliberalism for everybody. Because the people that is dying now are kind of the winners of the play. You know, the others are dead already. You know, the artists who didn't make it, who didn't find, you know, they are already dead anyway. So now it's kind of neoliberalism for everybody. And that's how it feels. And I think this is really everybody understood. The whole system, again, has to change. Corona just shows we can't fix it because it will happen later and it will happen for every generation of artists. I mean, the most of artists that kind of started with me, let's say, yeah? Like 90% of them 
it already happened. They disappeared in the, in the economic machine. So the 10% left, they are now struggling. But uh, again, I don't want to be cynical, but the problem is really systematic. And we will not find solutions in that system by kind of only five people in the space and at the same time we stream it. And I'm completely not out of that game. Eh? I'm artistic director of a city theater, so I'm also kind of in this logic and I have to deal with it. But it's really impossible. It's, it's really, again, eh? it's tragic. It's not dramatical. It's impossible to find a solution without general uh, basic income, really. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Milo, before opening uh, our discussion to the to those who are uh, following us on uh, on Facebook, let me return for a moment on the Ghent uh, manifesto. In the preamble of the manifesto, you say some way that the manifesto and the rules are a way to give an answer to a fundamental question. Hmm? So, what does a city theater of the future uh, looks like? So actually what I'm asking you is if uh, uh, the, the, the new situation inaugurated by the pandemic some way changes this, this scenario. So if, for instance, you would revise some of the rules, adding something or changes if priorities are changing, or if you think that actually it is the, the current situation is just uh, making evident what we already knows about the role of a city theater of the future. Yeah, some things are evident. Other things, um, I have to confess, I was perhaps uh, in the wrong direction. For example, when you read the rule, uh, every production has to be shown at least in nine cities in three countries. It sounds like uh, an absurd contradiction of every kind of sustainability. So it's, it's really, I think, there is a, a kind of improvement to see how can we adapt the rule or how can we change the rule? Because I'm not, I mean, okay, I made a mistake to put it on the walls, but we can rewrite these things. So what does it mean three countries, uh, seven, eight, nine cities? Because of course I wrote this to have not this kind of this city theaters producing for Rome and perhaps we show it in Torino, but that's it. No, that you go in other contexts and then you see Oh, this play that really works here takes a completely other shape when I'm in another country. And when I'm another rule in the Ghent Manifesto, when I go to a, to a place where there is no city theater, then you have to kind of, of uh, find or construct a network to, to only show it. So I think this is the theater that searches its players and that searches its public. And it's not using the players and the public that is already there because they know the canon and they know to play the canon. No, this is forbidden. And I think to create a searching theater was the right decision, but we have to adapt this search, but not only through Corona. I mean, there happens a lot of things. For example, one thing that is completely not in the, in the, in the, in the manifesto, because it was at that moment not so important for me, um, or oh, I thought it comes in directly through the artistic program is diversity. So it's a, it's, for example, a manifesto is only working on the artistic side, but not on the, let's say, on the structural management side. That was just the structure I didn't know. And there was a director before, and now I see, okay, you can, you, can, you can change the shows you show, and how you do them, and how you tour them, and that they are sustainable and everything. But if you do it with a, with a, with a system of people working fixed in the theater that are completely not reflecting this, so what for? And I think there you take, of course, step by step by step. And uh, yeah, and, uh, and you see what you can do. And now we are all confronted very simply to the neoliberal and architectural side of our institution. We have an architecture that is not adaptable. And we have a system that is, for example, when Entegen 20 years ago, uh, when Johan Simons was there, another uh, artistic director of the theater, they had around 120, 140 people working there. Now we do the same program and even more with 82 people, you know? So Corona happened in a moment when we are in crisis or in a kind of a constant crisis anyway. And then this happened. So they are coming a lot of things together at this moment. So that's why it's such an interesting moment to talk about, about structural change. 
because if we now don't change, we can't go on. We just we just can't go on. It's it's the moment in in Germany, of course, when or in Italy, I guess. I mean, if you say you can perhaps play in ten months or not, we don't know. So then you have to decide to really stop the whole machine, because then it will not, it will not, it will just not survive. And it's not the first art form that didn't survive in the context it was, you know. So perhaps the whole context now is shifting. And that's what I mean with uh, it's. We have really to think not how can we fix it, but how can we really make it new? Because fixing will not work. It perhaps will now work somehow with some money from the nationalization of whatever, and then we go in the next round, but the next round will, uh, will be the last one. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so maybe we can start opening uh, our conversation to the audience. Uh, so we have, so we have Simon Capel, who made several questions. So let's start with uh, one. Do you think artists should go back to theaters as soon as possible to work or take this time, these next months to meet, unite and think about new ways of making theater in the city? How can we unite to create new forms of theater? So you already discussed on this, but if you want to add something. Yeah, I, I, this question is a bit suggestive because I'm completely agreeing with the second part of it. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I would be with the second, uh, with the second uh, possibility. Okay. So, uh, so the, Simon is making a second question: Is what about the situation in Europe? How do you see the future of Europe? Um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm I'm concerning Europe. I always was very schizophrenic. You know, I'm a, a Gramsci style guy. So on the one hand, if I look to the European. Uh, functioning and what the European Union really is, I'm of course against it, and I think it will fail because of the national states, but also because of the whole functioning of this machine. It will fail by migration because because the politi politics of the uh, European Union are inhuman, and I don't want that it continues. On the other hand, going back to the national state, and that's more the let's say the, the positivism of the of the will. Going back to the national state, that's not an option. So the problem is that we don't have any other option that going towards Europe, that we continue this way. And I think what we should do is to realize the European idea and to democratize the institutions, the European institutions. And first of all, the very first thing we have to do is to, 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 to change the system we are living in, that there is people in Europe that have rights and other people that are even not here officially. So we should, the first step we should do now is really regularize all refugees in the whole, on the whole continent. That's really the next step. And I heard today that uh, I think the Minister of Agriculture said again in Italy, we should regularize them because if not, we can never, I mean, in South Italy, I know it a little bit from my, from my um, Vangelo project, we should regularize this situation or we will no, never overcome a mafia, for example, we will never get strong as a as a as a democracy against all these uh, all these criminal powers like the big the big enterprises, mafia, and so on. So it's it's king that we have to if we have yeah to to end it transnational powers working transnationally like criminality like uh, the the big entrepreneurs. We need also a transnational democracy, or we are fucked. So it's, 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 it's quite simple. So I'm, yeah, that's the, and, that's it. Um, related to what you just said, uh, I read an interview, uh, I don't remember where, where you were stating that uh, your, the work you have been doing in Matera uh, with the Nuovo Evangelo is conceived as a possibility of an organized uh, riot, uh, a riot uh, which associates migrants and farmers and organization uh, fighting against mafia against the system but, i think yeah yeah uh, and yes then you can also say something now but also I, I would like to know how do you think it is possible to conceive and organize riot now or riot revolution like a a 
a coordinate way of uh, react and uh, uh, contribute to a bigger change. No, I think I think I mean riot. I mean the problem we are living in now is that we are all living under constitutions that. They are completely fair, beautiful, and if you have one look in the European Constitution, in the Italian Constitution, even in the Brazilian Constitution, that are the most beautiful texts that exist, and I really would like to live like this under the laws we created. But the problem is that we are not doing it, you know? And of course, you need here a kind of a riot of civil society to just say, that's the Constitution we are standing for and we want it now. We want the same rights for everybody, you know, etc., etc., etc. And perhaps we need some more rights, for example, rights more focusing on ecology, etc. But we can do all this. And I'm in the end of the day, perhaps because I'm, com I'm coming from Switzerland, I'm really believing in civil society. I'm believing that we can educate the elite. We don't have to kill them. Yeah, we can educate them. And there can also be a bit, I mean, we can collaborate, but we have to effort install the laws that are in our constitution. It's, it's, it's really simple. It's like, again, it's like the, 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 the sentence for the riot we did with all these organizations, because there's no need to fix it. There are only these little communities that know exactly in that place or in that place or in that place, because the solution is everywhere else how you adopt the law. But to install the law, that's the first thing we have to do. And this we can only do with a majority. So all together. But then the real work, every minority has to do itself. But they have to be safe. They have to be united to really, yeah, to have this basic, let's say, this, 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 this just this basic uh, understanding to adopt the constitution. And, and do you think it is possible to act unite now that you are, we are all in isolated from one another? Then at, at somehow this situation makes it clear, like makes the, the 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 difference and the difficulties we are living clearer but somehow also separates uh, ourselves from from our friends from our companions families and so on and so forth so do you, do you think there is a risk that is going to be more difficult to react to revolt yeah, I, I think that, that Corona only shows the real separation one from each other that existed even before. I think it's it's perhaps a bit a naive uh, understanding of gathering that it means that people go together, you know. You can gather in many, many ways. But I think what we feel now is that uh, how strong we can be when we are together and how crazy it is to be separate, and that we are nobody. Each one of us, we are just, we are kind of, I would even say we not exist when we are alone. We are only existing in relation to other people, to a project, to whatever, whatever we want to build together. But I have no idea who I am when I'm five days alone. I lose completely control about, you know. So I think this is such a basic truth that uh, this only exists on how we relate. And I think now we should really, really, really rethink what are the rules of getting in relation to each other. That's what I said before. I, actually, it's, it's, a, it's an idea I have stolen from Donna Haraway <laughs> uh, <laughs> this afternoon yeah. when she was saying Anthropocene is kind of a perverse term because it says as if human beings could only act as they act since 500 years. But it's the system that makes them acting like this, that realizes when we have love, it becomes pornography. If we want, I don't know, if you want to be happy, it becomes a big house and a big car and so on and so on. So these are cultural translations of our dreams and of our very simple wish to be loved, to be together, to have some meaning in this life, you know. And I think to rearrange this, that it's not the meaning to make everybody the whole fool with 800 people, but the meaning is perhaps something else. And to disconnect some things that are like this, because we have a lot of wrong gatherings. You know that the biggest gatherings of people always happen under dictatorships. You know, gathering is not good or bad. So, I mean, and this is really like, we have, this has to, to go into our heads and to see how can it how can it be different? Thank you. I will get some more comments from uh, our Facebook page. Linda Di Pietro, Ciao Milo, 
how can we defend the precious artistic international dimension we created? No, not only the one of the festivals, but the one especially connected to places of coercion, communities in need and crisis, places far apart where you have been and you have given voice to, like Amazon tribes or farm labor in uh, Pacificata. Um, I think we have to, now we have to connect in other ways. I mean, of course, we connect uh, through petitions, we connect through more, let's say, political ways. For me, theater will always be linked, but this is my theater, will always be linked by being on the same space, different people from different continents, perhaps, but being at the same space, living together. Because for me, theater only exists in, of course, you are rehearsing three hours or five hours or six hours, but it's not only the rehearsal process, it's kind of being together for a certain time over years. Some of the people I'm working together, I know since, since 10 years, since 15 years, since 20 years. Linda, for example, that is asking this question, I know her since some years, you know? So there is, <laughs> there is, there is this kind of, 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 of uh, how to say, going away together. That's what is art or theater or collective art. It's not that just like you are a professional of, I don't know, lightning, and I'm the professional of writing, and because we are two professionals, we go together because it's faster and we get more money. That's not the kind of collective work I would, I would say it's in the, in the, in the core of, 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 of what is theater. Theater means that people come together, they are two, and dialectically something is created, a project that is much bigger as, as, as they are, you know? That's, that's what, what, what is, what is, uh, what is theater. And for me to reflect on a global level on what is this planet, what is humanity, what is the whole, I don't know, living community on this planet, we can only do it globally. We can only when we really connect with things. For example, when I went to the Amazon for the first time, I was completely blown away that this is in so many ways, completely the opposite of what I ever did and I ever thought and I ever knew. And there is no possibility to open a book at home and then read, I don't know, the wisdom of some, of some philosopher from the Amazon, because you can, I mean, I, I, I won't believe it. But when I see it in life and then I pass time, I will start to understand. And then slowly uh, there comes an idea out of it. For example, when I went there, a very simple uh, example, all Greek tragedies, because it's very European, end with uh, multiple su suicide. So everybody has to die, because this is tragedy and a lot of blood. For example, go to a German stage, and a lot of blood all the time, hundreds of liters. And, and uh, when we went there, they said, we are not interested in, we understand completely what it is about, it's an antagonism of, of uh, traditional modern society, blah, blah, blah. But we don't want to suicide, because it tells nothing for us to suicide. It's just like nonsense. And then we said, ah, okay, we have to translate this. And I think all this is very precious. And we shouldn't uh, stop it. On the other hand, Linda was saying not the system of the festivals, like to having one product, like, I don't know, a, a beautiful performance, and then bring it to different spaces can be very beautiful to show it in Sao Paulo, what to show in New York and what to show in Rome. But on the other hand, it became also a kind of, a, of a, like eating chicken from China. Why should Chinese people watch, I don't know, Heta Gabler from Schaubühne? It makes not, no sense, you know? Perhaps it's interesting, but it just became a kind of a, of a system of exchange. And if this is rethought, I think that's, that's I, also concerning my place, by the way, which are sometimes touring in a crazy way, it's interesting to, to rethink this and to say, come on, does this really make sense? And that's what we are doing now. Now we are sitting together and saying, okay, we can make possible that we go there in, in half a year, because this is really important. We want to do it, but we can do this, this, this. So, so we have to kind of take decisions. And I think this is, uh, yeah, this is, this is one thing that is yeah, quite new for me, for example, because I came out of, a, I think, the first generation of doing theater where the international system was when I started was already there. It was just normal that when you are kind of a bit successful, one day you will play in Tokyo. And, uh, you know, like two generations away, 
playing in Tokyo was the crazy dream, I guess, of Peter Brook when he was 20. And then he was like making a system and in the end he played in Tokyo and it was kind of very strange for him. So all this, that it becomes exotic again and valuable again is, is beautiful somehow. So we are going towards the end of our conversation. Let's take the last two questions. So one is by Emmanuel Curti. Having followed Milo's work here in Matera, I find that both his approach and the manifestos somehow anticipated what we are going through. I do agree that there is a risk of a more rigid neoliberalism, but at the same time, this corona time has declared the end of 19th century and opened a new scenario that coincides with what Milo has been saying. We call it now, some of us, the era of a new cultural welfare and uh, it could be easier, more than established theater companies, to break down those old barriers. How can we unify the efforts? Yeah, I mean, the problem is, and we see it in Antigone, that uh, in a crisis, the so-called rational states or neoliberalism can win over all traditions. And I was like, I'm always like, like, like torturing the classical bourgeois theater, but we all know that there is a big, big human value also in it to say we have a canon, we revisit the canon, we are kind of we are kind of having our holy texts and we are going back to it. Perhaps they are not the right ones, but the ritual to do it, you know, or to gather in these old houses and to have artists that have to play there because they are professions, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So the old nineteenth century state that now can be demolished by a kind of a globalized neoliberal super survive or die situation we are in now um, if we don't translate it to say okay we want to have these things fixed we want to have these things disconnected from this crazy dooms machine we want we are we are proud of it somehow we want to have time we want to have etc etc we want to have this space then we have to make this decision but of course the system in itself and that's i think the first thing of this question of emanuele if I'm not mistaken, um, where he was saying, will neoliberalism win? Yeah, I think uh, it's very probable that neoliberalism will now win again, because he always won through crises, you know? That's the logic of catastrophe capitalism, that he smashes everything and then he goes on, and everybody who doesn't survive this crisis is then away, you know? It's kind of a social Darwinism what is happening now. But all the artists that doesn't survive, they are gone. I mean, you know, and this is this is the this is the problem. So we have to translate this to a real disconnection of what we could call life or an economy of life, and this economy of value that we did now for five hundred years. So this should this should be a moment to stop it. Okay. So the last one by Lili uh, Maev uh, Klimenaga. Uh, it is well and fine to talk about the theater and new ways of making theater, but at the same time, you and the majority of theater makers who are giving talks right now are operating from a place of privilege in Italian social terms. So many young and lesser known artists are dependent on it to earn a living and are currently creating a lot of free content right now to stay afloat. What does it mean to talk about a new theater that takes into account this often ignorant and evenness of the system? Uh, could you talk uh, to this point? Yeah, she's completely, it's completely true. I mean, it's, uh, she's talking about the young uh, makers because I know her, of course, she's young. Uh, but there are also the old makers that are suffering under the same conditions. And uh, as I said before, we are in a neoliberal system. You survive or you die. And uh, there comes a moment that everybody is confronted to this. Everybody, the young, the old, the more and the less successful. Of course, the last person who will die are the most successful. This is for very, this is very true. And here I come from resolutions. I never believed in identity politics to say, you are privileged and white, blah, blah, blah. No, the problem is the system. Whiteness is a structural problem. I'm not interested if somebody's young or old. It's the system that makes this kind of qualities problematic or not problematic. And we have really together changed the system. We have to disconnect 
that if you are a beginner of work, you don't have time, you have to sell yourself, you have to kind of prostitute yourself to survive. And if you are in a situation like this, you have to produce like a lot of content and just sell, 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 sell. And it's, it's, it's a huge problem. It's a huge, it's, it's really a huge problem that only can be solved structurally. I don't believe anyone, and I'm happy to give in the end again, kind of a space where, I don't know, tryouts, young makers, very known makers come together and there is not this, this system of only like producing and functioning. I'm happy, but it's a very small, very limited space. And we have kind of finding, uh, I, I say again that the, the basic income is for me really at the moment the only solution to find a way out of this. Let's now only talk about art, to find a way out of this, this kind of, of, of completely antagonistic situation we are, we are in. And we are feeling sometimes stronger, sometimes less. Thank you, Milo. So we arrive at the end of our conversation. Let me just recall the next two uh, public dialogues. So next Monday, we will dialogue with uh, Shil Mbembe. And then on uh, Monday, the 18th, we will discuss with uh, David Quammen. So let me thanks again, Milo, for being with us today. And it was a great pleasure. Thanks for Thanks for having me. Uh, hope to have other opportunity next week, or maybe so yeah, I will. I will follow Ashil Bembe next time. When is next time? You said Monday. Next Monday at six so thirty. I will. Uh, you will have a question from Milo Rao. Okay, that's perfect. <laughs> so thank you, Milo, and thank you. Thank to you. Faini, Margherita Caprilli, Flavia Tomasini, and all the people at the Fondazione per l'Innovazione Urbana that make possible these dialogues. So thank you. And thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Take care.